So then the question naturally comes, and I get this question all the time. Look, you're saying these factors emerge early on. You're saying by age four, those abilities are there. Then that must be genetic. And we know that 15 years ago, there was a very famous book published by Hernstein and Murray called The Bell Curve. And that Bell Curve book essentially got a lot of uh, press. It's still widely influential in many circles, suggesting that genes and genetic transmission is there. The only reason why families seem to work is because families are passing on genes. Successful people have successful kids. Successful people have money. It really has nothing to do with family environments. And what I want to suggest today and show you a little bit of evidence on is that's just wrong. Genes are important, important. There's no question there's a genetic component. What we've also learned, however, is that genes express themselves differently in different environments. The gene environment interactions are very powerful. And then, in fact, genes themselves are not determining any fate. And that, in fact, environments play a much stronger role in a way that we really have yet to absolutely increase, increase our, our knowledge in, in, in American society. So what am I saying about family environments and why am I concerned? Well, if you look at a chart about where children are growing up, you know, many people here, I assume, uh, a lot of families, very healthy families I see here and functioning families uh, 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 may not be aware of the level of difficulty of, faced by many American children. But nowadays, for example, if we look at about 15% of American children are in families where there's only one parent throughout the entire life of the child, or the child, childhood's life. And that, what that means then is that the resources available to those children considerably less than they are in families which are intact and families that have more resources. And what we've learned from studies by demographers and by economists and by sociologists is that the divide is opening up in early family environments. The demographers call it the great divide. And the divide is essentially this, that even though we see more educated women working more than ever before, especially the most highly educated women. They're earning more, they're participating more, they're en enriching society in many dimensions. At the same time, we're seeing that those same women are investing more in their children. They're spending more time in child development than they did 20, 25 years ago. Why? Because it's be people have become conscious of the fact that those early years are so important, at least the educated people have. If you look at the less educated mothers, they're also working more, not quite as much more, but still working more. But the amount of time they spend investing has not changed at all. So what we're seeing is, again, there's two societies. There's one group that's essentially getting lavished with resources, being read to, numerous words by the time the kid's two and three years of age, uh, having a lot of uh, resources available in terms of parenting, and other groups of children where resources are weak, financial resources, and parenting resources are weak as well. And therefore, there's a gap that's emerging in society. And this isn't just a gap today. It's a gap that's going to affect the generation uh, in the next 20 or 30 years. So this is a serious issue. But if you're short of vitamin A and you have a severe shortage, a child will grow up blind. A small eye drop uh, administered in the first few months of life can prevent lifetime blindness. There's no cure right now for that blindness, but there's an easy remedy, namely intervening early in the life of a child iron deficiencies, lead abundance, iodine deficiencies, and the like, lead to substantial performance in terms of IQ and personality that persists throughout the life of the child. So what we've learned is that, yes, there are sometimes even critical periods. If we don't intervene early along, at the right weeks, in the right trimester of pregnancy and so forth, we are going to see substantial lifetime effects. We might be able to remediate, but right now, we lack the ability to remediate. So I'm not going to suggest a complete biological determinism, but oh, I am going to suggest that it gets harder and harder to remediate as we get older and older. And therefore, this is a huge issue in terms of social policy. Let me give you some positive news, though, about how we can solve some of our problems in American society. And I want to talk about a program that I've been engaged with and I'm still working with now called the High Scope Perry Preschool Program. Some of you will have heard about it. This was a program that was uh, conducted early uh, in the 1960s. It was an outgrowth, really, of the war on poverty by uh, Lyndon Johnson. And it was an attempt to try to uh, enrich the lives of subnormal, and I mean subnormal, these were kids who had IQs of 85 or below, children uh, living in a suburb or a small town just west of uh, Detroit, Ypsilanti, Michigan. These kids were all 
uh, African-American kids. They were all living in poverty. They were living in great disadvantage. What was done, and this was 40 years ago, uh, going on 50 now, what was done was that children were enrolled in this program and they were given simple family supplements. They were given enrichments that essentially involved some learning, some cognitive stimulation, as well as uh, parenting, taking kids to the zoo, encouraging the kid to work, encouraging the kid to, uh, to, to just achieve, saying the kid was excellent, things that middle-class children get routinely. And there were home visits as well. Parents were actually given assignments uh, and were actually visited and, and given some instructions, read to the kid, things that not the middle-class families would ordinarily do. Now, what did this program do? It randomly assigned half of this treatment kids to, to this, this uh, family enrichment, child, in, in early life enrichment. They were all three to four years of age. And the program, uh, and, and some half were assigned and half were not assigned, and we followed these children until age 50. Now we have long-term follow-up, experimental design. We can actually look at what happens to these children. Well, the most interesting finding from this study was it produced exactly what was found for Head Start. Many of you probably know about the Head Start evaluations done in the late 60s. Everybody said that Head Start was a failure. Why? Westinghouse Corporation did a study. Because it turned out that there was this initial boost. IQ went up early on in the, in the life of the program, but the time the kids were age 10 and 11, there was no higher gain. The kids who had, were in the program had no higher IQs than those who weren't. And if you were trapped in the mindset of saying, that it was only IQ that mattered, this program was a failure. Both Head Start was a failure and the Perry Preschool program was a failure. But what we learned when we follow these kids 40 years later, we can see many fewer incidents of crime, much higher earnings, much higher attachment to the larger society. And it was this program that has a rate of return of 7 to 10 percent a year. Where did, the, where did the effects come? It wasn't through IQ. It was actually through the children being highly uh, motivated and in terms of their social attachment, their social emotional skills, the so-called soft skills. And you can see this. You can see that we can actually now measure the soft skills and we can see this tremendous uh, improvement. So what it meant was that American social policy in early on dismissing Head Start and in focusing only on cognition was looking under the wrong lamppost. We literally were looking not at what mattered. And that's something that still continues to this day. I wish it were true that this message has been widely accepted. Did not yet, and yet we know this, and this has been found repeatedly. So how, how, can we, how can we then proceed in this way? Well, there are a number of programs of this type. There's an even earlier intervention, uh, the so-called ABC Darien program conducted in North Carolina. This program essentially started kids when they were six weeks old. These were disadvantaged kids and followed them until they were eight years old. The Perry program was only for two years. Kids were dropped back in the system. We still follow these children today. We have long-term follow-up. Now, the structure of the Abbasidarian program is more intense. It started earlier. And there were some gains in IQ. But once more, the major achievement was on social and emotional skills, the neglected avenue, the neglected feature, the neglected aspect of human development that American policy still ignores.